All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the CDP. My name is Joe Gabriel. I'll be your host for today. We've had an amazing October on the go. We've had an incredible series of events looking at space exploration. We've talked to astronauts and scientists and engineers, the people who are pushing the limits of exploration, looking out into our solar system and beyond, but then turning a lens back to take a look uh, at our planet as well. Today's event I have been looking forward to for a while. It's been a series kind of in the works, in the making. We're going to have a series of events uh, live from uh, McMurdo Station in Antarctica with the Cooperative Institute of Research and Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder. So they've got an incredible team down there using new technology like LIDAR to explore our atmosphere, to explore weather, to explore how things are changing. And best of all, they're going to take us into life at McMurdo and in Antarctica. We'll learn about the seasons as well as what it's like to live in this small city uh, in Antarctica, how they get the food down there, what they do for fun, all that sort of fun things. I see we have a lot of classrooms tuning in via YouTube today. That's awesome. Don't be shy. Use the comment section at the side. Uh, the chat sidebar, let us know where you're tuning in from. And of course, when the time comes, we'd love your questions uh, so we can get those answered. We're also trying to work in a live Kahoot today after our lesson. Uh, so be ready. We will share the link and the pin number to join that and we'll see who comes out on top. All right, more than enough for me. I think it's time to start making our way to Antarctica. I'm really excited to have Daniela Pennycook joining us. She is the Program Integrator and Communication Specialist uh, with the Crawford Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences at University of Colorado Boulder. So let's bring her in right now. Hey, Daniela, how are you? Hi, Joe. Thanks so much for having me today. Hi, everyone. We're excited to be here. All right. Excellent. Well, I'm going to tuck myself away. I'll let you tell us maybe a little bit more about the program and then uh, you can introduce Jackson. Thanks, Joe. We're joining you today from our uh, one of our new programs called Science Show and Share, um, where we're sharing science with classrooms and the public and whoever would like to tune in. Um, today I'm joining you from Boulder, Colorado from CU um, at Ceres. We are a large NOAA partner, um, so we work with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration doing um, research and sharing all this science with the public. Um, we're excited to um, share and travel to McMurdo, Antarctica today with you all, all with um, scientists who's down there um, studying the upper atmosphere. So Jackson is going to take us into his world for um, a little while and show us what it's like to live down at McMurdo Station in Antarctica. So hi, everyone. Um, Daniela, give me a quick thumbs up if you can hear me or uh, somehow. I'll... Yeah, we can hear you, Jackson. You can we hear can hear me. you well. Sure we're good. OK. So hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Jackson. Uh, let me pull up my, I think you're seeing my, pull up my screen share here. It's my presentation I'll be giving. So my name is Jackson Jandrew. I'm the uh, atmospheric scientist who's currently down at McMurdo Station right now. Um, let me just say real quick. Uh, Please, somebody just uh, holler at me if I start losing connection and we'll figure out where to go from there. But I'm going to tell you what it's like to live the day in the life of a scientist down at McMurdo Station. So I'm going to tell you about who I am and where I'm from. I'm going to tell you about what the day is like, talk about my research, and then I want to ask you guys some questions and I want you to ask me questions. So to start out, who am I, where am I from, and where am I now? So like I said, my name is Jackson Jandrew. I'm a fourth year PhD student in aerospace engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, so that means I, I have my bachelor's degree from Oklahoma State University, um, but I'm in the fourth year of my PhD degree right now. Uh, I'm a member of Dr. Xinjiao Chu's uh, atmospheric science research team. That's me over, can I see my mouse? Yes, that's me there. And that's Dr. Xinjiao Chu and that's our lab mates. Um, and fun fact, this is actually my second trip down here. I came down here in the summer of 2019 to do research and uh, I'm back now to continue it. So I'm actually down here for 14 months total. I got here in, let's see, I got here in late August and I'm gonna be leaving next October. So I'm here for a very long time. So where is McMurdo Station? This little video will show you right here. It's gonna zoom in on McMurdo Station. 
I'll let it play uh, more than once so you can see it again. But we are right on the Ross Ice Shelf, which is a giant shelf of permanent ice floating in the ocean right on the edge of Antarctica. Um, and we are on the Ross Island, which is a part of that ice shelf. So very, very far south, 77 degrees south latitude. So how do you get to a place like Antarctica? Well, the first thing you do is you stop by the closest landmass, which is New Zealand. That's the closest place to McMurdo Station, at least. Uh, and you get one last look at the warmth, you get one last look at the trees, and then you hop on a C-17 uh, military cargo jet, and the Air Force flies you down here. Fun fact is that the runway they land down here is actually floating on the ocean. It's a runway made of ice. They go out and they squish it down nice and good for the plane to land on. So that's fun, kind of scary to land on. So let me tell you what a typical day looks like at McMurdo Station. So every morning I like to start with a good breakfast. Um, breakfast is my favorite meal, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. Um, every, almost every morning I get an omelet made. I get a, uh, an, a, what is it? An onion and cheese omelet. It's kind of strange, but I like it. Um, there's a place thing in the galley here called Egg Line where they'll make you eggs however you want them and put whatever you want in them. I usually have the omelet, uh, muffin and a cup of coffee. Um, and when I can, I get fresh fruit. One fun thing about the fruit down here is you can only get fresh fruit when the flights come in. So we call them freshies and it's a big deal when you can get freshies. So it's a, when the plane comes in, everyone's excited to have an apple. Um, then I'll prepare for the lab, which usually involves making plans and gathering supplies and tools. Then I'll usually grab lunch before I go. Um, so I said the word galley earlier. The galley is what we call our cafeteria. Fun fact, galley is what they call the cafeteria on a boat or in uh, naval bases. So McMurdo started out as a naval base, so we still call it the galley. Um, there's a lot of naval history here. It was found by, you know, first people here came on boats and it was a naval base for a while. So we have some heritage there. Um, the meals time is important because it's a good time to interact with your colleagues and your coworkers and in and, and, you know, take some time off and, and enjoy some good food together. So then in the afternoon, I'll head up to the lab. Um, what I'm doing at the lab differs from day to day. I'm either going to be making observations or doing maintenance on the systems. It all depends on what, what the day has in store. If the sky is clear, I'm probably taking observations. And if it's not, I'll be doing maintenance. And then after I'm done, uh, if I'm done with the maintenance or whatever I had planned for that day, I'll come back and I like to take some time off to just, you know, it's good for good for your mind to do something like that. So some of my favorite things to do are really just find a nice quiet place and read a book or find some friends and play some board games. A lot of people down here do community stuff like board games. So speaking of community stuff, on the left here, I got a picture of uh, the biggest community event we have all year. It's called Ice Stock. It is the annual New Year's Eve music festival where all the musicians are either... Uh, they're, they're, they're McMurdo staff or scientists or it could be the guy making the eggs could be the there could be a band made of the guy making the eggs, the guy in the power plant, and the scientist. So it's a lot of fun to watch what what people get together to perform. Um, and so then I'm also going to show you a video tour of walking through my lab real quick. Um, and if Joe, if this is wrong, I want you to take over for me and play it. But I think this should play fine. So this is what the outside of our lab looks like. Um, it's green, which means it's actually a New Zealand building. We, we, they're nice enough to share a, a building with us. They let us reuse a room. Uh, so we keep it off the ground so that the snow doesn't pile up underneath it. Um, and so pay attention to this door I'm gonna open here. First, I kick, my, kick the dust off my shoes because we are on a very, very dusty island. Um, this door, look how thick it is when I open it. Um, quick view of the sunset but these doors on the most of the buildings here are pretty much refrigerator doors same concept as a refrigerator except you're trying to keep the cold out this time instead so you'll see just how thick these doors are um, this is the uh, porch for our lab and another giant door um, so then this is just what the inside of our lab looks like you can see a bunch of extra shoes there in case your shoes are very dusty that day our fancy red coats and then i'm going to open the door to our lab here this is ours a lot of dangerous equipment in here, so plenty of warning signs. Um, and so you'll see a quick view of the front of our lab. All these computers are what control our instruments. And I'll tell you more about the instruments in a moment. Um, but then I'm gonna cut the video to the back of the room and you can see some of my colleagues, you might recognize them from that picture earlier, working on the laser. Um, I believe they were replacing some flash lamps in our system. And then I'll show you what the actual laser looks like. Now this doesn't really look like the pin light you have or the, uh, the, the typical lasers you're used to, but this is what a big commercial industrial research grade laser looks like. Um, we got the, you, this building has been modified to shoot our lasers out the roof. I'll tell you more about why that's important in a moment. Um, and we actually have two whole uh, laser systems in this building, two, two LIDARs in this one room, one on the left there and one on the right here. And 
Uh, both of them operate independently. The hallway between them is very narrow, so it's very helpful that I'm uh, thin and tall. Uh, and they actually generate a lot of heat. So the whole back of the room, these are our cooling and power supply systems. So we have to have a whole portion of the room dedicated to just keeping things, <laughs> keeping things from getting too hot. So this is just a couple other pictures from inside of the facilities. But one thing I wanted to note about the inside facilities they have here is that uh, on the right, you can see a gym. That's that's where I go to work out. I go run every couple days to, you know, try to stay in shape the best I can. Um, and, and just a fun fact is that like, if there's something you do at home to keep comfort, you know, the 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 gym, the the library, stuff like that. We've got gyms here. We got libraries here. There's makeshift movie theaters. If there's something you have back home, they've probably tried to achieve something similar here. It's all just to keep people, you know, from feeling too much like they're at the bottom of the world. On the outside, it's hard to forget that you're at the bottom of the world. So down here in the summer, the tip, the, the average temperature is about 15 degrees Fahrenheit, which means it doesn't often get over freezing. You see there the max that I've ever experienced at least is about 35. So you better believe when it was 35, I had a t-shirt on. Um, the average winter temperatures though are in the negatives Fahrenheit. And uh, the minimum it will get, and this isn't too rare of an occasion, it'll drop down to negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's really when you have to start bundling up. But you see how beautiful it is outside. It's definitely worth getting out and having some fun in if you're able. So speaking of fun, what do we do for fun down here? Well, my favorite thing to do is to go for hikes. When the weather's okay, I like to go out for a hike. Um, the summer, it's usually easy to do this. Winter, not so much. But on the top left there, that picture you can see, this one here. This is when I took a hike out to Castle Rock, which is a hike, a seven mile hike across a glacier to this giant rock I'm standing on here where you get really, really good views of, you can't see it in this picture, but behind that cloud, there's a volcano. I promise you there is a volcano there. Um, then the other thing that's fun to do is in the summer when the water is melted up in front of the base a little bit, the animals come out. So we see penguins. Sometimes the penguins even walk into the base. We see seals, uh, skuas, all sorts of wildlife. Um, but then in the nighttime, when it's dark outside, you can't, it's, you're not allowed to go on hikes or anything for safety reasons, but a lot of people like to stargaze or watch auroras. So we can see the auroras. This is a picture we took this year. You can actually see our laser beam here. I'll show some more pictures later of that. Um, but there's all sorts of fun things you can do. There's even an international film fest where all, all the different bases down here make short films and send them to each other. So a lot of fun things to do. So not just all about fun though. Why are we here? We're here to do work. We're here to do science and research. So what my group does specifically is we do something called LIDAR. You guys might have heard of LIDAR. Um, LIDAR is everywhere from satellites to self-driving cars, and it's actually even in the newest iPhones. They have a LIDAR built in. But at its core, what LIDAR is, is it's a, it's an instrument or a tool where you send out light, you wait for it to bounce off of something, and then you analyze that bounce when it comes back to you. So what we do is we shoot our laser up into the sky, bounce off of different metal particles that are actually way, way up in the atmosphere. And we count how many of those metal particles there are. We can see uh, what kind of, how they're moving around in the atmosphere. We can see their temperature. And so studying those sorts of things like temperature, especially, lets us know about a really um, important and unique part of the atmosphere. This, where we're studying is right on the edge of space. Not many instruments can do that. And studying things like the temperature, let us know what the atmosphere is doing there. And that has consequences for all the global circulation throughout the rest of the world. So our, our temperatures can be used in studies of global warming, for example. So, you know, there's a lot of really important um, data that we can provide by doing this research down here. Um, so here's some other pictures of our LIDAR, what they look like. So I mentioned the LIDAR is shooting a light up into the air. Most of the time it's a laser. In our case, you can see our lasers here. This is what you saw us working on in the other pictures and this too. Um, at nighttime, we can take some really nice pictures of the beam and the aurora in the Milky Way and all of that. So it's a really beautiful environment to work in. And the lasers are cool. You can't deny that. So one fun thing about working down here that you may not know about is that due to the tilt of the Earth's axis, McMurdo actually has six months of sunlight and six months of nighttime. There's a brief, maybe one month in between where you get almost normal days and nights. But other than that, it's pretty much six months of sun and then six months of night, which is definitely something to get adapted to. Um, I've been here for the six, I haven't been here for the six months of night yet, but I've been here for the six months of day. And it's very weird when you go get a midnight snack and it looks like noon. Um, it really throws you off, but it's something you adapt to. So that is that. And I think I've got a couple questions here that Daniela is probably going to help me ask you guys. So I will pass that on to her, I think. Thanks, Jackson. Um, that was great. I 
we have a Kahoot question for you all, and we are excited to take your questions. So I'm actually going to bring Joe up here as well and see if he wants to share this Kahoot with everyone now or if we want to take questions from classrooms. No, let's do it. We've got time. Jackson, thank you so much. It, it really looks like on one hand, you're in one of the most remote places on the planet. But on the other hand, they, they really, it seems like they, they really go out of their way to try and bring those comforts to you, like a film festival and things like that. Pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I know we're going to have tons of questions. I can see groups already saying hi in the chat. Groups from Colorado, from Iowa, from Massachusetts, from here in Ontario, Canada. So keep introducing yourself in the chat. But for now, we're going to jump in and do a little Kahoot quiz. So uh, first thing you need to know is our link to get there. So if you head to kahoot.it, I'll pop that up there in the bottom corner. There we go. It's going to ask you for a pin number. And lucky for you, I am just about to share it. I've also shared it in the chat as well. But let's share my screen so we can make sure everybody's on the same page here. And everybody has that Kahoot pin number. There we go. So our pin number for today is 1487456. I see a few students or groups have already managed to make their way in there. If you're lucky enough to have one-to-one -one tech at your desk, maybe a tablet uh, or a Chromebook or something like that, you can join right there. If not, no big deal. Your teacher could pop it up uh, on the projector or the smart board and you could shout your answers out. If you can't get connected at all, shout your answers out anyways and then see uh, how you do at the end. So I see lots of students starting to pour in now. Um, and it's animal generated names. So we've got the prairie possum, the mighty wombat, the power dove. Let's see if I see any Antarctic animals yet that may be in here joining us. Any penguins or seals? Ah, the stellar seals. We do have, we do have at least one in there, and I'm sure there'll be some kind of penguin name in here as people continue to load. I have four questions ready for us. Twenty seconds for each question. Maybe they're true and false. Maybe they're um, multiple choice. If you get the right answer, you get points. If you do it really fast, more points. If you put the wrong answer in faster than anybody else, well, we got nothing for you. You need that correct answer. So lots of students still joining, lots of classrooms still joining. We'll give it another couple seconds. If you are, maybe you've got a tablet or your phone handy, you could scan that QR code there in the top right, and that will take you right into your spot. So this morning we had a live event with Duke Lemur Center and we had one generated name, the Snowy Lemur. Uh, and they won the event, which was kind of cool to see that happen. Although a Snowy Lemur, I don't know. I don't think that is something that you're gonna encounter in Antarctica. Okay, I think that's enough time. Uh, let's get our quiz going. So like I said, multiple choice. Uh, true and false. Sometimes you might have to click multiple answers. Let's see what happens here. Our first question, where is McMurdo located in Antarctica? Was it Elephant Island? Is it Ross Island? Is it the Antarctic Peninsula? Or is it South Georgia? And we've got about seven seconds left to get that answer in. Where is McMurdo located in Antarctica? Okay, we had a, a little bit of a split between the peninsula and Ross Island, but uh, Ross Island is that correct answer. Very cool. Let's see what that does to our leaderboard. The soaring duck is holding down that top spot. Let us jump to our next. What country is closest to Antarctica? This is one sent to me earlier from the team. We've got a few seconds left on the clock. Is it Chile? Is it Australia, is it New Zealand, or is it South Africa? Spoiler alert, all of these are kind of wrapped around the globe and relatively close to Antarctica, but one is a little bit closer. Oh, we went, a lot of our crew went with New Zealand, but uh, it is Chile and uh, Argentina would probably be right in there too. They kind of meet right down there uh, at the bottom of the world. Very cool. All right, what does that do? The soaring duck is holding the spot. Lots of movement down below. We've got another true and false here. The galley is where Jackson sleeps at night. True or false? The galley is where Jackson sleeps at night. 
few more seconds on the clock. Lots of answers coming in. All right, good job, crew. That is false. The galley is like the kitchen, the eating spot where Jackson goes in the mornings to get his coffee and his omelet with onions. All right. The clever zebra has snagged that top spot, but here's what it all comes down to this final question. It's a multi-select. You need to click or click multiple answers. So click each activity Jackson said he does for fun. Hiking, bowling, stargazing, or wildlife photography. Which ones are you gonna click there? Are you gonna do one, two, three, maybe all four? Hope you don't do all four. All right, so bowling, nice and low there, bowling nice and low because, correct me if I'm wrong, Jackson, I don't think they have a bowling alley down there. You know, it's really funny you said bowling because there used Hi. to be one about 30 years ago. All right, fair enough. Just kind of activity, random one that came to my mind. But um, yeah, I guess it's too bad that lane is is no longer in action. Well, let's see what happened to our leaderboard. Let's see who made the podium. Third place, we have the Balanced Gator. In second place, we have the Bold Eagle. And holding on to that top spot, we've got the Clever Zebra. All right, good stuff, crew. Thanks so much for playing with us today. Let us switch gears and let's go to a little Q&A action. So like I said, we've got classrooms on YouTube who have been introducing themselves. In fact, I already see a question here from YouTube. So let's grab a quick one here right now. So the pictures that you showed us of the animals, are those pictures that you took, Jackson? Yes. Yes, those are actually. Um, in the summer, uh, when I was here in 2019, it was warm enough that enough ice melted and the penguins decided to do their, um, they decided to hang out for the summer just right off the shore. So I was able to take those pictures just with my cell phone. And the seal, same thing, just saw him on the shore one day. Uh, I was only able to get that close because I had a seal researcher with me. We try to keep our distance, but I got lucky that day. Oh, very cool. Uh, all right, well, let's bring in a camera uh, classroom now and grab a question. So where should we go first? Let's go to British Columbia in Surrey. We've got Mrs. T's champs hanging out with us. Let's bring them in front of the center. That, oh. Why is it summer for you and it's winter for us? Hmm. Did you catch that, Jackson? She's wondering why the seasons are reversed. Why are you having uh, summer ah. when we're having winter? It's a very, very good question. So uh, the whole reason um, the Earth has seasons is because it's on a, its axis is on a tilt. So when um, one at one point of the year, the, one, the northern hemisphere is going to be closer to the sun. In the other half of the year, the southern hemisphere is going to be, or at that same point, the southern hemisphere is further away. So then when it switches around, the southern hemisphere is closer and the northern hemisphere is further away, if that makes sense. Yeah, That's yeah, absolutely. Question. Yeah, definitely. Good to think of the earth not perfectly standing there. It's got that tilt and at different parts of the year, different parts are a little bit closer, facing the sun just a little bit more. Perfect. Uh, good stuff, Miss T's Champs. Get ready with another question because we might come uh, and visit you shortly. Uh, let's see. We are going to go now to, <clears throat> excuse me, Miss... Melancon's crew are some fifth graders hanging out in Texas. So let's see if we can get them front and center. Here we go. Hey, fifth graders, how we doing? Oh, can you grab the mute for me? Yeah. Sorry, Miss Mrs. Melancon, if you can hear me, okay, you're on mute. We can't we can't hear the question. So sorry. They actually no. just had to go back to their other class. But the question was um, why um, they have McMurdo in the specific location it is. What about that location is the makes it a good location for McMurdo? Yes, I'm so excited you asked that because the answer is really, really cool. Uh, I'm actually really excited you asked that. So McMurdo is right 
where it is because well th this is the biggest is the biggest base and it's one of the older um permanent bases down here on the continent and it's right where it is because it is the southmost you can get by boat there's a place called uh, mcmurdo harbor or uh is it called we called it the, the bay the harbor it is the furthest point on the globe that you can reach and still be in a boat like on the water so that's why they put mcmurdo right where it is because um it was the base that they founded when they were trying to reach the South Pole. So it's a super cool question because I love the answer. <laughs> All right. Very cool. A little history there. Uh, let's go to YouTube and grab another question from YouTube. So Miss Snyder's crew is curious about the LIDAR. Is it built on site or did you have to transport it uh, to the station in one piece? No, oh, Jackson, can you still hear me okay? I think I'm cutting out a little bit, but I think it's getting better. Okay. So they Miss Snyder's crew was wondering about the LIDAR. Is it something that's put together on site at the station, or does it come to the station in one piece? Can you do that one more time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The LIDAR, is it something that's... Uh, assembled at the station or is it brought to the station in one piece? Yeah, that's a really good question too. Um, when the LIDAR was assembled and we built one of them in 2010 down here and one of them in 2017 down here, and they came down in a whole bunch of boxes and were built on, on the spot. Um, some of the tables, we call them optical tables, are almost as big as the room themselves. I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not sure how they got them in. Uh, it would have been very difficult, but Definitely, most most of them were assembled on the spot. And I imagine there's probably lots of spare parts because not easy to get something in if if, if something breaks down. We keep we try to keep one spare of every part that exists because it is not easy to get something down here in a hurry. All right, let's bring in another camera classroom here. Miss Painter's class is joining us in Salem, Virginia, some eighth graders. Let's bring them front and center. There they are. Hey, Miss Painter's crew, how are we doing? Oh, Miss Painter, for whatever reason, you're unmuted, but your sound isn't coming through for us. It might not have connected when you first joined us. So why don't you pop a, a question into the chat for us? Uh, and I'll snag that question when I see it pop into the chat. But for whatever reason, your your mic's not connected right now. That's no big deal. Let's go to another classroom. We're going to go to Utah this time. Uh, there we go. Let's bring them in front and center. American Fork Jr. in Utah. How are we doing today? There we go. Grab that mute for us and we'll be ready. Sorry about that. Hey, the kids here want to know what your favorite animal is. And they're hoping you're going to say something like tardigrade or nematode. So what do you know? So my favorite animal is uh, my favorite animal is actually not an Antarctic animal. It's the capybara. But uh, it's fun. Funny you say tardigrades. We actually have a ton of tardigrades on station. Uh, they're actually the animal that our entire waste waste treatment system is built around. It's all built around tardigrades. So I have a lot of friends. We, they call them, they refer to them as the bugs. They're always, their whole job is to make sure that the bugs are healthy, keep our water clean. That's cool. I had a chance to go down and uh, hang out with the, uh, the worm herders with the uh, Byron Adams group down there in McMurdo. So I miss being down there. What was that? I, I just mentioned uh, about four years ago, I had a chance to go down and hang out with the worm herders down there studying the tardigrades with Dr. Awesome. Adam. So yeah, good to see awesome. you. Have a good awesome. time. <laughs> very, very cool. Well, we may have that happen once in a while where Jackson might just miss something we say, but that's just a product of connecting via satellites from remote places on the planet. But the connection has been amazing so far, Jackson. The fact that you could play two videos for us all the way from Antarctica. Uh, yeah, we're getting pretty darn well connected, even in some of the most remote places on our planet. 
So Mrs. Painter's crew has a great question here. They typed it in the chat. This is our group from Salem, Virginia. And they're wondering, you mentioned a cooling system for the LIDAR. Why can't you just open the door? Wouldn't that be a good cooling system? <laughs> so that's a really good question too. Um, and I almost said this when I was showing the video at the lab, but so all those cooling systems, I said we have a whole portion of the room dedicated for cooling. The reason we put them all in the same location is because while we're operating, we actually put a curtain, close a curtain in front of all those cooling systems. And we pretty much do open a door to the outside. There's a fan on the bottom of the building that sucks air in and just blows it right onto all those cooling systems. Um, um, the trick is with lasers, you have to be very specific about what you're cooling. You need to cool some parts. You need to keep other parts warm. So that's why we have the air cool our cooling systems, and then our cooling systems cool the lasers. But you're not wrong. To cool those cooling systems, we pretty much open a door. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Well, as we're working our way through and answering questions, I do want to make sure that I share a few links with those who are tuning in with us so that they can go a little bit deeper afterwards uh, and find some more outreach material. So uh, here's the first one here where you can go to some of the outreach uh, by CRES, you can find that there. So I'll leave that link up there for a little while in case anyone wants to uh, take it down. I'll also send it out afterwards in an email so we can make sure uh, that the classrooms are able to grab the link from there. So we'll leave that up for another moment. And of course, this is an important link too. We have three more events coming up live from Antarctica. If you visit exploringbytheseat.com backslash McMurdo, you can find where to register for those other three events that we do have coming up. Okay, let's bring in another camera classroom. We still have more groups to visit. We need to go to, is that Florida? Yeah, we're going to Florida. We've got some eighth graders hanging out with us. Let's bring them in front and center. We've got a nice spread of classrooms today. Hey, Florida, how are we doing? Oh, we're great. Thank you. Go ahead. Ask your question. Yes, please. Allie's going to ask you a question. Yeah, stand up. Come nice and close. <laughs> Hi. Do you ever go into the ocean and look what's under the ice? That's a fun question. Um, myself, no, I don't. But I have quite a few friends down here who are also researchers. They're, they're university students somewhere. A couple different friends who that's their whole thing. Um, we call them the divers. They... Uh, uh, some of them go dive, some of them are soil, they, they're studying soil samples. They go dive down, take soil samples and test for methane. I have other friends who dive down to the bottom of the ocean and collect what's called a sea spider. Google that later. Uh, they're very cool. Um, and then I have uh, other friends who are actually my neighbors in my office, they're right behind this wall here. They, uh, they, they sometimes get in the water to, cause they study seals. So there's a lot of groups that do, but I like to stay dry. All right. Fair enough. I know if I got the chance to go, that's the team I pick is the dive team. I, <laughs> I love diving. And so up here in Canada, we're used to some cold water diving, especially when the winter hits. So yeah, very cool. Uh, I've got more questions coming in via the YouTube chat, which is great. So let's grab another one here. Oh, I like this one. Uh, so Jackson, you mentioned you're going to be there for a while. You've obviously met people who have been at the station maybe numerous times. Is climate change having an impact around the station itself? Are things changing? Yes, there's absolutely a change. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of uh, climate change is a super, you know, scary problem. It's something that I think about half the people in my field are almost ex exclusively working on. It's super, super important. And we can actually see a lot of it very clearly down here. Um, one of the things with climate change is that it, uh, the poles are often more impacted than other places because of uh, the way the global circulation uh, is and everything. And down here in 2019, I mentioned the, wa the, the water, the ice had melted, which it does every year. And the penguins came by. That was actually the year we saw the most wildlife, which on one hand, awesome. On the other hand, they were there because the, all the, a lot more of the ice had melted than normal. So in 2019, more ice had melted than it had ever done before. And then this year, before I got down here in the middle of the winter, some of the sea ice melted, um, more, more sea ice than as far as I know, it melted in a long, long time in the middle of the winter. So we're very, very clearly seeing those changes down here. Um, and there's, there's very real consequences too. I knew uh, a few groups that were supposed to come down here. One was studying a different group, studying seals. One was studying, still doing some other kind of diving, but neither of those groups or penguins, neither of those groups was able to come down this year because the sea ice was melted. Um, so, you know, there's the sea ice itself melting is a real 
consequence on its own, but there's even, you know, indirect consequences that are affecting the way that other re research goes on in the base. So yeah, it's a serious problem. You know, you can't concretely say these are global warming, but you can't deny that it's a scary situation right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, we had an event a little while back where they were talking about how species ra ranges are changing and how a lot of the, the marine life, especially the invertebrates uh, around Antarctica, don't have like hard shells, a lot of soft material. But as the temperatures mm -hmm. change, the crabs and, and other species can move closer and closer to that area. So there's, there's lots of little changes happening and it's going to have a, a big impact on the ecosystem as it continues to happen. If I okay. can say one more thing on that too, is yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a really good reminder to myself that, you know, when I'm down here seeing these direct changes of direct, direct instances of climate change, more than just looking at the plots and charts and graphs that I do all day, um, is a really, it's a, it serves as motivation, you know, like I, I gotta, I gotta, sometimes I don't want to go to the lab, I, I need to, you know, it's a reminder of what my work is helping out towards. So, um. Yeah, it's, I, I, I'm, I know I'm not alone here, uh, but the other scientists feel the same way. All right. Colorado Doral Academy is joining us today. Some 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. How are we doing today? I'm sorry. They just all had to leave. <laughs> oh, no. We hit the end of their time. Did they leave a question behind? Um, they wanted to know how many people are down there. And if there's any normal houses, families. <laughs> so if I heard the question right, it was how many people are down here and are there regular families? Um, so on our base right now, there's 350 people tomorrow, maybe the day after another 150 are going to arrive. And then later in the week, another hundred. So by the end of the week, we're going to have about 650 people here. Um, by the peak of the summer, when all the scientists are here and all the support staff are here, we're going to have 1,100 people on base. So we go from a very small town in the winter of about 150 people to a, well, it's a small town still, but it's a lot less small. Um, so it's definitely going to be a lot more people soon. And the question about families is a really good one, too. Uh, a lot of the people who come down here year after year, they actually have a, uh, it's not too uncommon to have a husband and a wife employed down here. As far as I know, there's no uh father son mother son mother daughter father daughter any any uh multi-generational families on base right now but i i know that in the past that's happened and other countries actually uh, uh have different they handle that differently so at least at our base i don't think there's normal families but there are couples down here married couples okay cool question now we're going to keep our fingers crossed because as the base doubles in size there'll be a little more strain on the internet so we won't see uh, how our events go as we continue on over the next few weeks. Uh, I want to share a few more links here. So if you would like to check out some more uh, of the other webinars uh, here with Science Show and Share, we have a link here that you can check out. I'll leave that up there uh, for a few moments. You can take that down. Of course, I will share this link um, in an email with everybody who registered for the event as well. We'll make sure that you have all those links uh, right at your fingertips. Uh, let's see if there's a YouTube question before we try and mix in a few more uh, of our camera classes. Oh, this one's kind of interesting. Um, how long have they been kind of building and adding to McMurdo? Could you say that one one more time, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. How long have they been building to and adding to McMurdo? Um, so if I heard that right, how long have they been building McMurdo? Um, mm -hmm. They've been, so McMurdo was founded in the, was the very oldest building that we have here is from the early 1900s. I want to say 1906 or 1908. Call it a uh, Discovery Hut. It's, if you Google, you can Google, maybe your teacher can Google Discovery Hut afterwards. Um, and they can check it out you guys can take a look at it but that's our oldest building here um but the oldest buildings we use most of them are from the 50s and 60s in the 50s and 60s is when it became a naval base and they built a lot of the stuff here um most of the uh so that's like most of the older buildings are from then but they're they're still building new buildings um there's a new building going up right now uh, covid made the construction project a little weird but it's going to be done next year they're going to put some new 
uh, I believe data centers in it. It's going to be some, I'm not quite sure what it's going to be used for, but they're, they're still building. Um, and we still use some of the really old ones too. So. All right. Well, we can probably squeeze in one or two more camera questions. So if you're in your classroom and you have another question for Jackson, give me a big wave and that'll kind of be my signal uh, to come back to your class. I see our class in Surrey is flagging. Let's get them in. All right. Closer. There you go. How, <laughs> how hot is the laser? How, how hot, hot is, is it? the laser? Yeah, there yeah. you go. Oh, how yeah, hot is the laser? Um, the laser is pretty hot. Um, we, 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 we try the best we can to be very safe in our lab. That means we keep track of reflections. We keep track of, you know, we don't want to accidentally hit a mirror and send it the wrong direction or hit something shiny that's accidentally a mirror and send it the wrong direction. Um, but with anything, you have a little accidents every once in a while, and it will, it feels maybe like getting stung by a bee. Uh, I'll say that. Uh, it's not terrible. It doesn't feel good. You definitely don't want it to happen. Um, but if it does hurt, I can't really tell you a temperature. Um, but in terms of power, the strongest one we've got is 20 watts, and the weakest one we've got is microwatts. So the different different lasers are different strengths, but the powerful ones, definitely don't want to get hit by those. I think the strongest laser I've accidentally been zapped by was two watts, and it hurt. So... All right. Um, let's take one more from YouTube. So the LiDAR, has it ever malfunctioned on you? Oh, we'll try that again. Jackson, uh, this question here is from YouTube. They're wondering, has the, the laser, the LiDAR, has it ever malfunctioned on you? Does the LiDAR ever what? A malfunction. Has it ever malfunctioned? <laughs> yeah. Um, by design, no. But uh, everything, nothing ever works exactly as you want it to. So yes, it does. That's the that's one of the main reasons um, I'm down here. And this isn't just a system that we uh, installed in a building and we just let it do its thing, like some systems are. Um, this system is super complicated and it's very high resolution and everything like that. So. Um, that that means there's a lot of parts that it, it's not it does it's not intended to break that often, but things do break down, and that's part of my job is to be trained to repair them whenever they do break down or malfunction. Um, most of the time, it runs fine on its own, but we got to be prepared and trained for when things do malfunction. All right, and so Jackson, maybe you know you kind of shared a little bit of, of of what you've done so far at the base. Is there anything with time that you have left, which seems like you've got a nice chunk of time? Is there anything that you're really looking forward to doing that you haven't done yet? Is there something you're excited to do or to try at the station? Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, it is hard because uh, as a scientist, you know, our number one responsibility down here is to work. You're supposed to, you know, we got to prioritize that above everything else. But one of the uh, community things they do offer that I would really like to try if I have the time is they actually do a volunteer. Uh, so there's, down here, you don't, you're not reached by any radio stations like back home. So they have radio uh, on base, but somebody has to choose what music to play. So they actually do volunteer DJ service. I would like to be a volunteer DJ and play my music for everyone on base. I think that would be fun. Um, we'll see if I have time for it. Uh, of course, work comes first. But if I got time, that's something I would be looking forward to. Oh, yeah, that sounds really cool. That's awesome. Very, <laughs> very cool. Well, let's bring Daniela back in, uh, in Colorado with us. There's Daniela. And I'm also going to throw up one more link here because, of course, we want some feedback. We want to know what you thought about today's event. Uh, so there's an option there for some feedback. Again, I know it's going to be hard to grab right away, but you can also go back to the YouTube video and I will send uh, this out to everybody. We've already shared the outreach link where you can find a little bit more uh, outreach materials that you can use with your classrooms, especially as you prep for our three events that we do have coming up, looking at the seasons, uh, looking at uh, an intro to the atmosphere, and then intro to space weather. That one sounds really cool too. So very, very cool. Daniela, how are we doing? 
Doing great, Joe. Thank you so much. And Jackson, thank you so much for joining us today. What a treat to get to connect with you all the way from Antarctica. It's been so fun to hear about your journey and you're really just in the beginning. So um, I look forward to continuing to see what you all do down there. And I hope you get to DJ. Thank you. All right. Well, a shout out to all of our classrooms, to our camera classrooms. Thank you for those amazing questions. To our YouTube crew, thank you for the questions. Thank you for playing along uh, on Kahoot. And of course, we can't wait to see you uh, in the next events that we do have coming up. So I should let you know that the next one is Seasons in the Antarctic. It'll be October 18th at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern. And one more time, I will share that link where you can go ahead and you can register for that live event. But I will share all these links with everybody who registered for today. So for now, again, Daniela, Jackson, thank you so much for an amazing first event. And uh, yeah, we can't wait for what's coming next. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.